Hello and welcome. I'm Eric and I am here to help you to discover biblical truth and to apply it to your life. Now, the clothes that we wear can sometimes be used to identify us. A police officer's uniform is different from that of a firefighter's. A Marine's uniform is different from that of an army soldier. And for many of us, our clothes can tell us something about ourselves, whether we prefer function over form or form over function, whether we prefer comfort or whether we prefer it to look good, the colors we like, the colors that we don't like. In this video, we're going to be in Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 through 11, where we'll discover that if we are in Christ, we need to put on a new outfit, one that reflects who we are. So let's take a look at Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 through 11, which I have pulled up here. Uh, Therefore, consider the members of your body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them. But now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices, and have put on the new self, who has been renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him, a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and freeman. But Christ is all and in all. Now, in chapter 3 of Colossians, Paul moves from a doctrinal emphasis in chapters 1 and 2 to practical application of what it means that Jesus Christ is supreme. He starts off by telling the Colossians that they were to live for heavenly things and not earthly things, to not be distracted by the worries and concerns of this world, but rather to seek after Christ and the things that he likes. Now, because we are to be passionately concerned about these things, our lives should reflect that passion. Our lives should model this concern of what is heavenly and not what is earthly. It should be evident that we who are in Christ are living new lives. The way we act now in light of salvation should not resemble the life that we lived before. We live in a new reality. Now, Paul gives two main commands to the Colossians to encourage them to reflect this truth. First, they are to put to death sinful behavior, and then second, they are to take off sinful attitudes. So we see the first command here in verse 5, right here. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. We're told that we are literally, in the Greek, to put to death these sinful actions. Now, Paul gives a vice list here, similar to other lists of sins mentioned in the New Testament. So let's briefly explore what these sinful behaviors are. First, there's immorality. Now, this is the word from which we get our English word pornography. It is the idea of illicit sexual activity, any sexual activity outside the bounds of marriage between one man and one woman. Now, this is a broad, encompassing word that covers every sexual sin. Now, the second word listed here is impurity. This is the idea of being unclean. This uncleanness is brought about by living apart from God's desire. It is living in disregard for God's commands. It's living a wasteful life, a life that has lived with no regard for morality whatsoever. You don't care what's wrong or right. You just do what you want to do. Third word that we have here is the word passion. Now, the word passion can be either good or bad. But given that we find it here among a list of sinful behaviors, uh, this passion is to be understood as something that is not right. A passion is, is a strong feeling that motivates you to action. And in our context, this is the idea of letting your emotions lead you into sinful behavior. It is giving in to your feelings, unconcerned about the consequences. You follow after that. Your feelings control you rather than you controlling your feelings. Now, the fourth fourth, uh, phrase we have here uh, is evil desire. Now, as with passion, desire can be good or bad. And usually in the New Testament, it is used in the negative sense. And there's no doubt about that in our context here in uh, in this passage. As Paul adds the descriptor evil to it, which carries the idea of being morally rotten. 
Uh, this wicked lust, this evil desire leads to action. It's wanting something that is forbidden. It seeks that it was contrary to God's character and to his law. Now, the fifth sinful behavior that Paul uh, lists here is greed. Greed is simply wanting more. Now, often we apply it to money, but it really can be applied to anything. Greed, greed is wanting more. And the problem with that is that you can never have enough. Uh, the, the search for more becomes the chief characteristic of your life. And that's why says Paul, Paul here says greed is, amounts to idolatry. Whatever it is that you're greedy for, uh, that you that you must have more of that becomes your idol that becomes your god and you cannot worship god and worship what you're greedy for whether that be money fame maybe it's your friends maybe it's your family maybe it's things god desires all of you and if you're pursuing more of anything else you are worshiping that thing now, these five sinful behaviors that Paul lists here are not all that there is. Now, you can turn to other places in Scripture to see more, like uh, Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. Uh, these behaviors have their consequences now and in the future. Uh, the consequences here, look at verse 6. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. Now, sin is something that God simply will not stand. He will not tolerate it. It's an affront to his character. It is disobedience to his will. Uh, and this, this, this disobedience, it's a willful rejection of God. He is perfectly holy, perfectly pure. He is unstained. He is without blemish of any kind. There is no shadow in him. God's response to our sin is wrath. Now, wrath is to be understood as a slow buildup in response to something that affronts your internal disposition. It's not an outburst. It's not hurling down lightning bolts the moment people sin. When we speak of God's wrath, we speak of a perfect wrath, one that is not overwhelmed by emotions. God's wrath is a steady swelling. Now, God chose the people of Israel to be his people. He offered them a choice, follow and obey him, and thus have life, or choose to be disobedient to him and face death. The people of Israel were fickle. They would obey for a while and then turn away. Just look at the book of Judges over and over again. And then what did God do for them? He rescued them time and time again. Now, when the kingdom split, the northern kingdom of Israel turned from God pretty much from the get-go. Uh, what, what did God do? For many years, he sent prophets to warn them to repent or else, and they didn't. And then God's wrath was poured out on them, raising up the Assyrians to carry them off into captivity. The southern kingdom, Judah, lasted longer, and they had moments of revival. But they soon followed after Israel in denying God, defacing the temple, and refusing to repent. God raised up the Babylonians to carry them off into captivity. Now, in all of this pouring out his wrath, God remembered his promises, and he saved a remnant, a portion of his people, to carry out his mission and purpose. Now, we ought not to be afraid to talk about the wrath of God. We just need to remember that his wrath is a perfect wrath. It is a wrath that is in response to our sin, and we have all sinned. Look at verse 7. And in them you also once walked, when you were living in them. This echoes what Paul wrote to the Ephesians in chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. See, we have all sinned against God, and we all deserve God's wrath. But God doesn't want us to experience his, his wrath. He instead loves us and wants us to be in a right relationship with him. So what did he do? He sent his son, who became one of us, to die in our place. At the cross, Jesus bore the wrath of God, and he paid the penalty for every single one of our sins, past, present, and future. He died for us. But God raised him from the dead and offers eternal life to us through Jesus' resurrection. 
The thing is that you have to accept his offer. Je Jesus does won't apply to you unless you turn from your sins and turn to him and make him the Lord of your life. You must place your faith in Jesus. It is the only way to escape the wrath of God for your sins. And when we have placed our faith in Jesus, we are now called to be different. God saves us. He loves us enough that he doesn't want us to stay the way we are at the moment of salvation. He wants us to be like him. That's why the command to put to death the sinful behaviors that we just mentioned. That's why Paul gives us the next command found in verses 8 and 9. The, the second command has two parts. But now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another. Let's just stop right there. What are these things that we're supposed to put aside? What is it that we're supposed to drop like a, a hot pan that you picked up off the stove? Well, the first is anger. Now, this is the same word that was used just a moment ago that the New American Standard translated wrath. This, uh, once again, is a slow buildup. But since we're talking about us, we're talking about an imperfect slow anger. This is an unhealthy, settled anger that turns into a grudge. Now, the second attitude here is wrath. This is a, a different word. This word implies a bubbling, boiling anger. Th this is a wrath that is seen in outbursts. It's like a volcano quickly erupting and then settling down again. Now, have you known people like that? quick to anger, ready to blow up at the slightest annoyance. Now, it's not a pleasant scene to behold or to be on the receiving end of. The third attitude that we are to put aside here is that of malice. Now, this is having a wicked disposition. It's harboring ill will towards someone else. You just re rejoice when something bad happens to them. You're sad when they're happy. It reaches the point where you actually wish something bad would happen to somebody else. That's malice. Now, the fourth, fourth attitude here is slander. Uh, this is the word from which we get, we get our word blasphemy. It can be directed against God or against other people. Uh, it's speaking of something, speaking something false or defamatory about someone. It, it is hesitating to call something or someone good when they are. But it's also quick to point out flaws or faults, whether they are perceived or real. Now, the fifth attitude that we're to put aside is abusive speech. Uh, this is foul speech. I'm, I'm sure we've all known people who it seems like every other word is a cuss word. Uh, but foul speech doesn't just mean cussing. It's low talk of any kind. It's bringing down the conversation to a crude level. Off-color jokes, sexual innuendo, those sorts of things. We could possibly even throw gossip into this one, though it is oftentimes fed by some of the previous things we've looked at. Uh, now, the sixth thing here, in the form of a command here, is do not lie to one another. This one is pretty self-explanatory. We are to be honest with one another. There should be no falsehood, no hypocrisy, and no deceit among us. When we live in an atmosphere of lying, there is no trust. And if we don't trust one another, we will not be united in God's purpose and mission for us. Paul tells the Colossians to put aside these things, and it should be clear why. They do not reflect who we are called to be now. They represent the way we used to be before we met Jesus. Now, unfortunately, these things that Paul mentions are too often seen in our churches in the body of Christ. This is not the way things ought to be. We are called to be different, and we can be different. Look at verses 9 and 10. Do not lie to one another, since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices, and have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. Now, these two verses provide us the rationale for our changed lives. Now, a, a word picture to help us get it right. We're to put all those sins and behaviors and attitudes aside because we took off the old self, the old man, as we would take off a dirty, worn-out garment. We took it off and we threw it away. And then we put on the new. It was out with the old and in with the new. Out with the dirty and in with the clean. Now, this happens for us when we place our faith in Jesus. 
Too often, though, we continue to act like we did before. We try to put back on the old clothes. When we do that, it's like wearing overalls to a black tie gala or a three-piece suit to go out hiking. It doesn't fit our activity. It doesn't fit who we are. At Salvation, we shed the old way of doing things for a new way. Our new self is being renewed. Renewed, renovated one room at a time. That's the idea behind renewing. It's a gradual process that occurs over a lifetime of God working in us to change us to be more like Him. We are being renewed to a true knowledge that is an experiential knowledge, a firsthand knowledge. The Christian is not to have a secondhand faith, but a firsthand encounter with the living God. Now, this renewal is according to the image of the one who created Him. Our new self is being sculpted by God to reflect himself. Now, the old has gone and the new has come. The old looked like the world. It was an affront to God because of sin. It did not reflect God's character. The new looks like God. It puts to death sinful actions. It lays aside sinful attitudes. It is to reflect God's character more and more every day. Now, as such... If each of us is turning from sin and to God and growing spiritually to reflect Him, that has an impact upon uh, us as a group, not just as individuals, but as, as a body of believers. There will be a unity there that wasn't there before. We will see less and less of our differences and more and more of Christ in each other. Look at verse 11. A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and free man, but Christ is all and in all. When we are in Christ, He is all that matters. Now, for those of us in Him, it doesn't matter our ethnic background, that's the Greek or the Jew, or our religious background, circumcised or uncircumcised, our cultural backgrounds, barbarians and Scythians or even our economic backgrounds, slave or free. If we are in Christ, we are His. We are one in Him. Christ is all. He is the preeminent one. He is all that matters. And He lives in each of His people. He is in all. He doesn't differentiate between someone from Africa and someone from Asia. He doesn't show favoritism towards someone who used to be Muslim over someone who used to be Hindu. He doesn't prefer a rich man or over a poor man. These external things do not matter. If you are in Christ, you are His. Now, this means that the church should reflect Christ's attitude, and we have to confront ourselves. Are we trying to reach one segment of the community over another? Do we harbor attitudes of favoritism? Is there something that we can do better to show this unity that we have in Christ? Each one of us must also ask these questions in our own hearts. We are called to be holy, that is to be set apart for service to God, reflecting His character in our daily lives. And this means turning away from our sins. This means that we, you know, that we have to say no to those things. The old way of doing things, that old man, the old clothing. Now, that can be a hard task especially if most of our life was lived apart from God. Habits are hard to break, but it is so worth it to get rid of the old and to put on the new. So believer, does your life reflect God's character? Are there sins from your past that you still struggle with? My friend, turn them over to God. Lay them aside. Seek to develop new habits that honor God. Let God work in you to make you like Him. Now, right now, choose to dress like you are. You are a child of the King. Now, perhaps you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior. Without Him, you will face the wrath of God. The wages of sin is death. You will be eternally separated from God. And that is a horrible existence of torment and pain, just being separated from Him. But God doesn't want you to perish. He doesn't want you to be apart from Him. He sent His Son, Jesus, to die in your place to bear His wrath for you. He died, he died for you. He rose from the dead to offer you a new life now and in an eternity with Him. But you have, to ex you have to accept it. 
You have to turn to God away from your sin. Ask Jesus to forgive you. Ask him to be the Lord, the boss of your life. He will save you if you cry out to him. And Jesus, take off those dirty grave clothes and put on new garments that are spotless and brilliant. But you have to trust in Jesus. Now, in our next video, we'll move on to Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. And there we're going to see that a life lived for Christ is one that has lived in community with one another, sharing holy attitudes, holy motivations, and holy actions. Thank you for watching, and God bless.